Last time on the show, we reviewed a game called Heavy Metal Fact 2 on the PC. And in that review, I mentioned something called Metal May, which was my tribute to video games that featured heavy metal in some way, shape, or form. And today, we're going to get specific because the music to the game that we're going to be talking about is actually heavy metal. Or is it? Well, this game for the PlayStation Portable is called Undead Knights. And the music is taken directly from a, I don't know, death metal, black metal, extreme metal, zombie metal, I don't know, whatever you want to call it. It's pretty good music, but that's not necessarily all we're going to be talking about today. But if we are going to talk about the music, I've got to look the part. So, roll that intro. Back in the late 2000s, Tecmo was trying anything and everything to capture the hearts of a Western audience that was beginning to turn its attention to games developed by Western companies. With development houses coming out with games like Gears of War, Tecmo released 2010's mediocre Quantum Theory on the PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360. But a year prior, they let loose Undead Knights on the PlayStation Portable, a game with a simple but addictive gameplay mechanic fleshed out over 20 levels with varying difficulty. So is Undead Knights worth digging up to play, or should it stay buried in the PlayStation Portable's graveyard? We open to a cutscene detailing the game's premise. Once there lived a king named Kirk Gladys, who was controlled by the power-hungry villainess, his wife, Queen Fatima. Fatima poisoned the king's mind into destroying the House of Blood, bringing the deaths of Knight and leader Romulus Blood, his little brother Remus Blood, and Remus's wife, the Princess of Cavalier, Sylvia Gratis. On their deathbed, Romulus made a pact with an evil being known as the Beast, turning the three slain house members into necromancers capable of raising an army of undead soldiers to fight their cause. It's a tale about betrayal and the length some will go in order to achieve revenge. Talk about a totally heavy metal storyline, right? What's that? Oh, the shirt? Yeah, well, you know, I wanted to go with the whole shtick of the black metal, extreme metal thing, you know, going on the, with the music and whatnot. What, what's that? I got something in my teeth? Is that it? Is that why you're looking at me funny? I got like spinach or something in my teeth? Like this one? That one? Oh man. I, I knew that I shouldn't. Hey, honey, will you not make spinach right before I do a review? Huh? Undead Knights is broken up into four acts with five levels apiece, making for a total of 20 levels, all of which have varying difficulty. Easy, Normal, and Hell will all play similar when it comes to gameplay, and will mostly all be required to be tested out. I'll explain why in just a minute, but first, isn't it a little ridiculous that we're still naming difficulties after silly things, and then kind of mixing them in with normal things? Easy, Normal, Hell? It doesn't make sense! It'd be like, in Doom, hey, not too rough, hurt me plenty, ultra violence, very hard. Just keep it simple, folks. Easy, normal, hard. After starting the game, depending on the character you choose, you'll begin hacking away on enemy knights with the square button as your basic attack and the triangle button with your more powerful blow. Pressing the circle button brings up a circle on the screen that begins filling clockwise with blood. When it reaches the 12 o'clock location, the enemy you're holding will turn into a member of the undead. They will then begin to fight enemies for you. You can hold a large amount of zombie knights, but after a certain point, if you try to make more, they begin to die off once you hit your limit. There's all kinds of moves you can either buy or learn as you play through the game. Grabbing the undead with circle, you can slam them into the ground with the triangle button to weaken enemies around your general area, or throw them again at soldiers with the circle button. The right shoulder button commands your army of undead to do your bidding, particularly if you want them to bum rush an enemy to destroy them, take out turrets, 
barricades, or certain bosses. And the left shoulder button refocuses the camera behind you. You can move with the analog only, which makes sense, but the camera is where we start to see problems with the overall design of the PSP. While the camera can be shifted left or right with the D-pad, the location it's in creates a difficult reach to press taking your thumb away from the main form of movement, the analog stick. While the PlayStation Vita, the system's successor, improved upon the design, it's clear that this game would have been much more welcome on either a PlayStation 2 or a later release on the Vita, so it can take advantage of that right analog stick camera movement, instead of having to refocus the camera constantly with the left trigger. Regardless, it's still mostly manageable. Each chapter can last anywhere between 7 minutes to an hour depending on how successful you can be with your characters, and before major chapters we're greeted to some rather well done voiceover detailing bits of the story, along with a short blurb about each level before it begins. The game does a great job of pampering its story, full of little details that really flesh it out. Even the villains that take part in the cutscenes chew the scenery, providing solid commentary that adds some backstory to each one. I like when games do this, because it gives the player the chance to bond with the story through these characters, even if they are villains. But honestly, there's a sympathetic tone here that makes sense considering most of these people probably deep down don't want Fatima in charge, and are probably brainwashed by her head games. And once you hit the ending of the game, there's certainly a surprising amount of depth to Fatima's backstory that I wouldn't have expected from a hack and slash plotline. But the real issue I have with the voiceover work is twofold. For one, their mouths don't move in game. Take Final Fantasy VII Crisis Core, for example. Released two years prior, it has gorgeous in game cutscenes that aren't using CGI, with mouths moving in time with the words. But Undead Knights? Nope. No movement. One speculation could be due to the sheer amount of stuff going on in this game, which we'll get into in a bit. The second issue I have with the voice acting is the forced swearing and modern voices of our three heroes. As you go through the game, you'll occasionally hear our protagonist banter with the villains, but the protagonists speak in a much more modern and American tone, with random swears tossed in for the hell of it. Meanwhile, everyone else in the game speaks a bit more proper European accent from the medieval ages. It just doesn't make sense together, and it kinda ruins the cutscenes. If pressing the circle and triangle keys together during combat when your rage bar is full, you'll let loose a battle cry before slicing the enemies to bits. But when doing this, we get swearing that while I don't personally have a problem with it, it just doesn't fit very well. What? I don't think he was talking about you. So with the swearing combined with more modern sounding voiceover accents on our playable characters, it just doesn't flow well when the protagonists speak. There's mini bosses spread throughout the levels, with the fifth level of each location generally housing a main baddie to take down. Each one has a cutscene showcasing some lively characters, all of which don't necessarily seem to be trying to defeat you for selfish reasons. They really tried to bring a more sympathetic idea, and I like the notion of an inner struggle within myself. Am I truly fighting the bad guy? or am I the villain in this story? It was honestly very groundbreaking and I wish that this was fleshed out even further. While the story breaks the mold beyond what is expected of an average hack and slash plot, the controls yearn for a less cramping controller. Having to press the L button constantly to refocus the camera becomes a literal pain. And while the camera can be spun right or left with the D-pad, I desired a second analog, or some sort of accessory with ergonomic grip handles to move my hands further away from the trigger so my hands wouldn't cramp as much. This isn't necessarily a dig on the game's design itself, as the controls themselves may makes sense. I just wish that this was released on a system that better utilized the control scheme. You'll definitely have moments where you'll need to refocus the camera quickly so you can throw your zombies in a specific direction, only to find that your aim is completely off. Put them in the Iron Maiden. Iron Maiden? Excellent! Execute them. Bogus. 
There's a lot going on in Undead Knights. Once a large enough army of soldiers has been turned into zombies, your characters will have much greater strength, allowing them to tear down structures either via a hit points bar being drained or through quick time events. These interactions never really grew stale for me, despite not being a big fan of quick time events myself, though I will say I had a difficult time between identifying the square and circle button on screen since the shapes were so small and similar with no color distinction. At times, this reminded me a bit of Wild Night in the sense that you can use your zombie horde as a bridge to walk across empty chasms, as shields to take damage from projectiles and rolling barrels, or to throw headfirst into certain objects, blocking them from attacking you. This resulted in some rather hilarious moments. But it's not all laughs here, as Undead Knights also suffers from some slowdown when the action gets really furious. There's also this weird effect during certain larger enemy takedowns, where you'll need to throw multiple zombies zombies onto a large foe in order to render them immovable. Attacking while the zombies are crawling on your enemy results in some crazy slowdown effects that I believe are intentional, but it's hard to determine the difference between stuttering frame rate from a special graphical flair or slowdown. The graphics, while quite dark and gloomy, makes sense considering the story and horror-esque vibe. Ugh, yeesh. These graphics are as muddy as a My Dying Bride album cover. Hmm. Or actually, more like an Opeth album cover. Eh, metal semantics. While I don't have an issue with the muddy palette, I find some moments a bit visually wonky. Like this scene, where there's a flame in the background while this cutscene is occurring. Also, is it just me or do the characters look stuttery at times? For example, check out these more powerful enemies blocking your shot. Oh, my washer load is off balance! Enemies range from archers to shielded knights, soldiers on horses, spear knights, enemies with claws, evil zombies controlled by Fatima, and larger foes like these guardians. While some of the enemies become more formidable zombies, I wish they took advantage of the difference in knights with more drastic changes per each one. Instead, most of the soldiers just turn into regular zombies, with a few exceptions. At least you can turn the bigger guys into the undead. As you move from room to room, the game enables a checkpoint system which really helps, as you'll die quite often in normal mode as the game gets harder. But as you reach the end of the game, normal mode becomes increasingly more difficult, sometimes impossible. Some bosses I spent an hour and a half on and still couldn't beat them. Most levels on normal take about 15 to 30 minutes at a leisurely pace, though I reached the point in the game where I couldn't advance any further on normal, right around level 15. I found myself not only dropping down to easy frequent but also replaying earlier stages on Hell difficulty just to gather more points for the customization shop. Depending on how many points that you acquire, as well as how quickly you can beat a level, you'll get points based on a specific ranking at the end of each level, allowing you to spend them in the customization section of the game. You can level up your attacks to include new combo moves, or to boost your health and weapons, as well as a few necessary features which really make the game much easier, like the rolling dodge. There's also items further down in green that work as temporary boosts, but I felt like they weren't worth it, as I would have rather spent my points on permanent items. The issue here is that playing on normal difficulty won't net enough points to play the game while you're going through a casual playthrough. So I found myself going back to the older levels, finishing them on hell difficulty, and just grinding points just to get better armor and health. But by the 15th level, I just wanted to be done with the game already. It's regressive in these types of games to go back and grind points as it halts the forward momentum you've made in the game. If this was an RPG, it might be different, but because this is more of a hack and slash beat em up type of game, I would have rather they allowed the game to progress through the normal pace and then if you wanted to go back and play through the game again on hell to unlock more special features or to unlock with the rest of the moves in the game then that would have been preferred i personally only beat the game in the end on easy despite finishing almost 85 percent of the levels on normal while i would have been more interested in beating the game on a higher difficulty i found out that the endings are the same on normal and easy though i can't confirm hell's endings being the same dialogue bits are slightly different depending on the character you pick, but you're not really addressed as an individual, so the game gets away with dialogue that applies to each protagonist. It's lazy when games do this, but I get that they wanted to probably save money, time, and space on the UMD. 
finally, we can talk about the music. Tecmo saw fit to include an orchestral soundtrack that wraps around the in-game music taken directly from death metal and black metal bands Valdur and Lightning Swords of Death. Personally, I think the music is a bit more black metal inspired than death metal, with plenty of blast beats and guitars that sound like they were recorded in a log cabin far away in an evil forest. But heavy metal subgenres can be so intertwined at times that it's tough to pinpoint. But the production quality kinda moves me more into the black metal extreme metal direction. We've been fortunate enough to play music instead by our black metal friends Crown of Wallachia in this episode, so if you like what you've heard so far, you probably also enjoy Baldur and Lightning Swords of Death. I had fun with Undead Knights, well, with most of it, but the execution feels limited due to being on the PlayStation Portable. It's a pretty decent pick up and play game as the standby feature on the system allows you to come back to it at any point, along with the frequent checkpoints. I think the music is great, and the performance of the voice actors is mostly well done despite some awkward inconsistencies between the protagonists and the antagonists. There's definitely some ghoulish fun to bang your head to here, along with unlockables, I guess you could call them that? Yeah, you can unlock golf clubs for Remus, a chainsaw weapon for Romulus, and a microphone stand for Sylvia? Strange. Undead Knights will most likely not be seen from again because Tecmo folded developer Team Tashion into the rest of their development staff. An unfortunate end to a project with such potential. Despite my feelings of flaky difficulty regarding Undead Knights, I still think it's worthwhile of a pickup. It's a pretty cool game for all heavy metal enthusiasts, PlayStation Portable owners, and horror movie fans. Speaking of flaky, this makeup is ruffling my feathers. I'm gonna go run through a car wash for a couple hours or something. But before I do, I have to do some kind of death metal growl. I mean, it would be totally inappropriate if I didn't do something like that. So here goes. Really, Zelda? Gotta steal the spotlight on this one, too? Thank you to the following patrons. Your support means the world to me. Want more Dude You Haven't Played This Game? Make sure to stay subscribed to the channel and check out these videos enclosed below. As always, thanks for watching.